Um, so let me introduce Dr. Jennifer Thaler. She's our first speaker and she's going to be speaking on fear as biocontrol. It's an interesting way to start this, the, the, the session. Um, she's an insect ecologist whose research is focused on plant defense and predator prey interactions in agricultural systems. She particularly likes working in solanaceous crops like tomato, potato, and tomatillo. And she teaches insect ecology and chemical ecology. And I'm gonna interrupt you for a second, Jennifer, because I never introduced myself. I'm Betsy Lamb. I'm the coordinator for ornamentals for New York State IPM, and I'm your MC. And as you can tell, it's informal. So um, feel, keep asking questions in chat. I'll try and field questions for Jennifer and it's all yours, Jennifer. Okay, well, wonderful. I would reiterate just, Fear is in my title, but we, that's the bugs we want to be afraid. Everybody else, we do want to have fun this morning. As Betsy said, feel free to interrupt or throw a question into the chat if you have a if you want to ask something while I'm giving my talk. Um, I will just start again by thanking the team of organizers. This has just been one of the most well-organized conferences I think I participated in. So Thank you, Betsy and Alejandro and Deborah and the whole team of people who I know has been involved and all of the audience for coming and other speakers. And I just think I'm looking forward to this as a, as a great day. So I wanted to tell you about some of the research that we've been doing in our lab. And as, as Betsy said, it relates to fear as biological control and how we can use predators in a way that we really might not have thought about to, to control pests in our gardens. And the foundation of this, we know, everybody knows that predators eat prey. Here's a stink bug eating a beetle. But what's really important that I want to bring your attention to today is that a lot of, whoops, a lot of what goes on with this predator prey interaction is because the herbivore detects the predator and knows that it's there and responds to its presence by doing things that can result in potentially benefiting the plant. And so what I'm gonna talk about today are what are non-consumptive effects and what are their implications for biological control? Then we'll talk specifically about non-consumptive effects of soldier, beetle, soldier bugs on Colorado potato beetles and ask some questions about how do the Colorado potato beetles detect their predators and how can we potentially manipulate this response for future benefits in agriculture? So I want to introduce this idea of predation risk. And I want to do it in what I call a tritrophic context. So you can see at the base here, we have our plant. In this case, it's a tomato plant. And it's being fed upon by a pest, in this case, a Colorado potato beetle and a stink bug, the predator at the top. And we know that, of course, predators kill prey. They reduce the abundance of prey of herbivores in our system. And we call this the consumptive effect. And this can benefit plants. This can reduce plant damage and, and increase yield. This is the backbone of biological control. But what we're learning is that predators can also scare prey. They can change the behavior, the physiology, the life history of the prey. And this is what we call the non-consumptive effects, because these are effects that happen to the prey without the prey being eaten. And this can also trickle down to affect the plant. And what's really interesting and really what got me inspired to start this work was a study that came out in 2005, and they had looked across many, many systems, terrestrial, aquatic, agricultural, natural. And what they found was that 85% of the predator on the prey's resource, in our case, the plant, was because the prey detected the predator and did something about it. And so that means that if we want to manipulate predators as biological control agents, we really need to think about how they're changing prey behavior. And this was a very broad study. So they showed these effects in natural systems, old fields, where they found that the presence of predators changed the abundance and the diversity of plants. 
They found this in conservation oriented systems like Yellowstone National Park, where wolves had been restored. And they found that the, yes, wolves were eating elk, a major prey item, but they were also changing the behavior of the elk. The elk were moving from feeding in risky habitats to places where they could hide from the wolves. And this was having a really big effect on the, re the regeneration of the trees and plants in Yellowstone. And of course, this is important in biological control where we're using predators to control prey. So I want to dive into kind of why is this so important? Why is it that prey responses to predators are so critical? And any organism really has a choice to make. They can decide to grow, which basically means to eat, or they can defend themselves against their energies, against their enemies. And if we think about these as two extreme choices, here's a, a, imagine a deer. We have lots of deer around here. And if they spent all of their time foraging, they would grow really quickly, getting food. But they would very likely get eaten because they're not paying any attention, so they're vulnerable. On the other hand, if these, this same prey item protects itself, so is either a, the mama deer and they're vigilant or the baby and hiding from its predator, the extreme result of this is starvation. You have to do both of these things. You have to eat and you have to protect yourself against predators. And this trade-off in how the prey invests its energy really op is what opens up this new avenue for biological control. And I think about two pathways by which we can get successful biological control. So on the right, we can have the typical non-consumptive pathway, the, the right in red. This is where, let's say the prey knows the predator's around, but it doesn't respond to it. It keeps on feeding. So there's no cost of this response because the prey hasn't responded. So the predator could, let's see if I can use my mouse here, stay, stick around and feed on the prey, in which case this would decrease the prey's fitness because they're presumably getting eaten and we get good biological control. On the other hand, what often happens is the predator leaves and the prey stick around and they do fine and therefore you get weaker biological control. That's, those are two outcomes that can happen if we're just thinking about predators eating prey. But if we go over onto the left and think about the prey responding to the predator, then we get some different outcomes. We can, this is where we have, whoop, we have the potential for this non-consumptive pathway to be strong, where the prey can detect the predator, uh, but uh, they can respond, maybe they decrease their feeding, but maybe they do something else that makes it like increase how they extract the nutrients from their food. We've shown that can happen. And that means that they can well, in, keep maintain their fitness even in the presence of the predator. That would weaken biological control. However, if we can get the prey to respond to the predator and not allow it to compensate, give there a big cost to that reduction in feeding or whatever the prey has done, that can decrease prey fitness and promote biological control. So what we would like is to have biological control systems where at least one of these outcomes is positive. Either the prey gets eaten by the predator, you get a strong consumptive effect, or the prey responds to the predator in a manner that's really costly that reduces its future fitness. And so these are the kinds of patterns that we're investigating in the lab. So one of the things, so to start out, I'll just, or to continue, I'll just say, well, in different systems, what have people done? And how do herbivores respond to the threat of predation? And as um, it's been really exciting for me to see research that's coming out in a whole bunch of different cropping systems. And these, these responses to predators are very common. And they, they relate to patterns that we know as humans. If you get attacked, if you feel threatened by a predator, you could try to fight off your predator or you could run away from your predator. That's a wise move a lot of the time. Or maybe you just hide, just hope the predator doesn't see you. And 
These can be both acute responses to the immediate presence of the predator, but they can also be long-term responses, just when you know the predator's around. And so what are some examples of that? Some of the early work that we did was working with hornworm caterpillars. You can see the tail or the horn of the caterpillar. And this one is feeding on a tomato plant. And what we found was that when they were exposed to these stink bug predators, the caterpillars would thrash around and act, actively fight off the predator. Because a large, you know, a large one of these caterpillars can be almost as big as these, as these stink bugs. And so this could be an effective defense. Often the predator would actually run away. Other people have done work in cucumber plants. So cucumber plants um, can, you know, we know a major pest of that are the striped cucumber beetles. And if wolf spiders are hunting around on those cucumber plants, the, the cucumber beetles will actually frequently fly away. That's good, because if the beetle isn't on your plant, it can't do the damage. We can think about aphids. So aphids have very different life history than these caterpillars and beetles we've been talking about. And um, work done here at Cornell showed that foxglove aphids, when they were feeding on pepper plants, um, they could be attacked by parasitoids. And that, that would often cause the aphid to drop off the plant. Some of those aphids can crawl back up and continue to feed, but a lot of them hit the soil and they just die down there. They can't get back up. And the last example I wanted to give you was on beans. Thrips can be eaten by predatory mites on beans, but also when those thrips detect predatory mites, they eat less, they damage the plant less, and they really, it really increases their mortality rate. So lots of different ways and different systems that predators can affect the behavior and the survival and the feeding damage that prey do. I'll just take a second here in case anybody has a question. We don't have any in yet, but people can type them in. Okay, wonderful. So I'm gonna transition now to talking about the study system for today, which is the Colorado potato beetle system. So as many of you know, Colorado potato beetle is a huge pest of potato and other solanaceous crops in the Northeast. And here you see up in the upper left, you see this glorious or hideous picture, depending on your perspective of a, just a potato plant that's just covered with these larvae and it's just absolutely being decimated. And there is a more beautiful picture of the adult on the bottom left. And a big pre a predator of these prey, of these beetles, the Colorado potato beetle, is the spine soldier bug. It's a native predator in the Northeast. It feeds on a lot of soft bodied uh, insects, caterpillars and beetle larvae. Here's a, in the upper right is a picture of a nymph and attached to its beak is a Colorado potato beetle larva that it has killed and it's now feeding on it. But in the bottom right, you see a picture of a stink bug that's stalking its prey. It's wandering around on the leaf looking for prey. And so we used this system, we took advantage of this system and the way this insect feeds to use it to study these non-consumptive effects of, of the stink bug on the prey. And we did this because you can see the beak of the prey. And when the predator is about to attack, it actually extends this beak and uses it to stab its prey. And the very last segment, what I'm showing you with that arrow, is really just a mechanical way of piercing the cuticle of the prey. So what we could do is just take a razor blade, nip off that beak, that very last segment, and create a predator that could hunt its prey, but not kill it. So here now you can see a picture of a, <laughs> yes, I see that question. The spine soldier beetle, it, soldier bug is a stink bug. If I called it the spine soldier beetle, that was a mistake. I meant to call it a stink bug. So what you can see on the right here is the stink bug actually trying to attack the Colorado potato beetle. And the, uh, the beetle is feeding. It might stop feeding when the predator's around. The predator's gonna try probing it with its beak, but it can't actually pierce it. So it can't successfully feed. So it can harass the beetle, the beetle can think it's getting attacked and do it all of its responses, 
but it can't actually been killed, be killed. So this is a technique that we that we that that we that we've been used been using. It kind of does look like the brown marmorated stink bug, but it's not um, it's not a pest in houses. Right? <clears throat> and you do have a couple okay. other questions, but you can wait on those if you want. So you can do them whenever you want. Oh, okay. I. Uh, so you have one that says, can you recommend favorite habitat of spine soldier bug? Yeah, the spine soldier bug is really neat. It's very common in old fields and in it, it, we see it in, a, in our potato fields. They overwinter in forests, the forest edge. So a, a really nice way to get it is actually to get it in the spring. It'll actually move from the forest into your, into your fields. And that's kind of nice. Or into your garden. And the other question is, so don't plant cucurbits near potatoes or do? Well, um, why wouldn't you? I don't know about planting cucurbits next to potatoes because did I say something that I didn't mean to say anything connecting cucurbits to potatoes? Okay, but we'll, 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 we if we'll get more information as we go on if we need. Yeah, yeah, we can get some more information. All right, you can explain that later. <laughs> okay. All right. So we used these predation, we, you, th so we, we wanted to look at the effect of um, stink bugs. Okay, I think there's still, yeah, just maybe we'll just call it the stink bug the whole time. The stink yeah. bug. The so spine soldier beetle bug is a type of stink bug. Thank you. Yeah. So we are using this predaceous stink bug to, uh, see what it does, see if we can use it to control this Colorado potato beetle. And we have to start out two treatments. We just have Colorado potato beetle feeding on the leaf and we can measure how much leaf feeding it does. And we can measure how much damage, how much leaf feeding it does in what I'm calling the control. And that's where there are no predators present. You can see that it does, it does some damage there. We can compare that feeding to when we have the beetle, but it's coupled with a predator, in this case, this, this stink bug that has its beak nipped. So it's just this predation risk treatment. And what we can see is that when we have the beetle feeding with the stink bug, the beetle feeds less. So this is interesting. The beetle does respond to the stink bug predator. And this feeding less is defense. When the organism is feeding, it's moving and creating all kinds of smells, and it makes it easier for the predator to find it. When it stops feeding, it's just harder for the predator to find, and the, the, the beetle is less likely to get attacked and eaten. These, this, this effect on the larvae has consequences over the life of the, of the beetle. And larval exposure to our stink bug predators translates into reduced fecundity, reduced egg, egg production by the adult beetles. So on the y-axis, I'm showing you the total number of eggs that the Colorado potato beetle adults laid when they had been exposed to the stink bug predators as larvae. And what you can see here, this is oh, they lay eggs for oh, a little over 35 days. So we're showing you that life cycle. And you can see that the control beetles are just higher number of eggs laid compared to the predation risk beetles that you can see in red. So this is, this is starting to look promising. The beetles that are exposed to predators feed less as larvae and they lay fewer, adult, lay fewer eggs as adults. We, want, we were curious though, what would happen if the adults themselves were exposed to the, the stink bugs, stink bug predators? Here you can see the adult stink bug trying to attack the, um, the adult Colorado potato beetle. The adult Colorado potato beetles can pretty much defend themselves. Every once in a while they get eaten, but mostly they can fly away or drop off the plant or move away. But they do have to consider their offspring and where they lay their eggs. So we still thought, even though the adults aren't really eaten by the stink bug predators, maybe the adults change their behavior. So we did these experiments in the field. This is the Freeville farm, if anybody's done any work out there. And you can see this is our, our plot of potato plants. And we created little, um, little, 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 little patches in the field 
where we either have a, a, a set of potato plants that are controlled. So again, there's no predator, or we have a set of potato plants that are experiencing predation risk. And the way we did this, as opposed to using that risk predator where we had nipped off the beak so that it couldn't attack, here we actually put plants in the center of the field, whoops, where in the center of each plot, where we bagged the plant and inside the bag, we put Colorado, we put uh, the predaceous stink bug. So this creates a local area where you have high density of the stink bugs, but they're trapped inside this bag, so they can't attack the beetles. And then naturally occurring beetles were allowed to colonize the plot. Okay, so what, hap what, are the, what happens to the adults? So we looked at the adults that were colonizing either the, the little patches that were control, so they had no predator, or the patches where we had put predators in there to make this predation risk environment. And we actually found no effect on the number of beetles choosing to colonize those patches. On the other hand, we did find effects on the amount of damage, plant damage that they did, and the amount of egg, the number of egg clutches that they laid. So you can see the leaf area consumed um, by, the, by the beetles in the field is lower in the red bar. Those are the beetles that, were, that had colonized patches that were exposed to the predators, and they laid fewer clutches of eggs, and that resulted in smaller numbers of eggs being laid as well. So the adults are also responding to the presence of the predator. So this kind of led us to our next question, which was we got really curious about how the beetles knew that the predators were around. Because that's the central point. The central point of these non-consumptive effects is that the beetle or the prey has to be able to detect the predator, but how do they know? And we got inspired by some work that had been done elsewhere. Um, and there's a company actually called, um, that, that, that man actively manipulates the sense of death by using odors from predators. This is showing you actually a growler of mountain lion urine, mountain lion pee. And you can buy this. If you live, say, in Arizona, and you have javelinas or something that's damaging your garden, you can buy urine from, these, from the predators of those prey, spray it around your garden, and potentially protect your garden. Now, we don't, have, we don't really have mountain lions here, and we don't have javelinas, but we wanted to take the essence of this, which is that the odor of predators is something that we could manipulate and potentially use that to protect our plants. It's certainly a lot cheaper to release mountain lion pee than it is to release a mountain lion and safer. And maybe we can apply that same concept to biological control in agricultural systems. We're talking about much smaller things. We got inspired by, by other literature that had been done using lady beetles or ladybirds. And these, these are also predators. They eat a lot of aphids. And these ladybirds, when they're walking around on the leaf of the plant, they leave tracks. They actually leave odors on the surface of the leaf. And when an aphid is making its decision about whether to come and feed on that plant or not, it can detect the odors that the ladybird has left on the leaf. And if it smells those odors, it actually is less likely to accept and land on that plant. So inspired by mountain lions, inspired by aphids scared by the odors of their predators, we wanted to see if, if our beetles were responding to odors from predators. So we had this hypothesis that the Colorado potato beetle would detect the stink bug aggregation pheromone. And they're called stink bugs for a reason. They are very stinky. And if you pick one up, you can smell, you can smell that odor. If, and um, they release the odor when they're mating, when they make a kill, the, the adult predators will release the odors to bring in mates and to 
you know, offer them a food item. They all, in the spring when they're aggregating to mate, uh, they release this odor to attract conspecific, to attract other, other predators, conspecific predators. And they have, if you, if you open up their body, they have a huge dorsal abdominal gland. It's releasing a really lot amount of the, of the pheromone. So we thought we smell this pheromone, maybe the beetles smell the pheromone. So we did an experiment just to see in the lab whether the beetles could respond to the odors from the stink bugs. And we set up what we call an olfactometer. And that is we had containers that either had contained the stink bugs on the left or just contained wet cotton as the control. And we basically blew air over those odor treatments and then took that air that either smells like the predator or doesn't smell like the predator and piped it over Petri dishes that had beetle larvae in them. And so we can then compare the feeding of beetle larvae that are exposed to the odors of predators. They don't see the predator, they can't get it touched or attacked by the predator, they can only respond to an odor coming from the predator. And when we do this, we see that those stink bug predators odor, odors do reduce larval feeding. So on the left, you can see larval, the amount of leaf feeding done by larvae that were getting the control odors, so just the wet air. And on the right, you can see how much feeding they did when they were exposed to the odor that was coming from male predators. They don't actually respond to the odor coming from female predators. We wanted, to, we thought maybe this would interfere with their host plant acceptance. And so we offer in this, we followed that up by offering them a choice between either a leaf that was just directly cut from the plant or a leaf that had a little dot of the male odor blend onto it. Do they, have a preference for the leaves that don't have the odor? And the answer is yes. If we give them a choice, uh, you know, over 70% of the beetles will choose the leaf only compared to the leaf that has the odor on it. So this is getting us really excited about the idea that, wow, yes, these prey are responding to odors of the predator. So, we wanted to build on this and start thinking about, okay, we have this result from the lab. How could we actually apply this in the field? So we wanted to try to figure out what are the cues that are responsible for eliciting the greatest response in the prey. And so we did more tests in the olfactometer just to really figure out who actually, who's actually releasing these odors. If we want to manipulate it in the field, we really want to know. Is it males? Is it females? How many predators do we need? That kind of thing. So we set up more olfactometers. Again, I'm showing you some of the, more of the details here. You can see this picture. We filter the air to get rid with carbon charcoal filter to get rid of any impurities in the air. We then add the humidified water because nothing likes responding to dry air. And then again, we have different predator treatments in these jars. And we're honing in on this abdominal scent gland, and we used these lab tests really confirmed that it was a specific odor coming from that, from that scent gland. We can actually extract the odor from the scent glands themselves and run it in the olfactometer. And what we find is that the gland is most developed at seven days after that stink bug emerges. So we can look at the odors that are coming from one day old adults, seven day old adults, and then 14 day old adults. And really we see much more coming out of these seven and 14 day old adults. So young adults might not be releasing the odor that might affect whether prey can detect them. And we found that those glands were comprised in large part by um, a couple, a small number of very fragrant, very volatile chemicals. One is E2-hexanol and another is alpha-terpineol. You can see it on the gas chromatograph on the right there. And there were also more minor components of that gland, benzyl alcohol, 
linalool, and terpineol. Uh, so I see, a, um, I see a question in the chat about whether these odors could also attract predators. And that's really interesting. I'm not going to talk about that today, but there, it used, that was actually the original way these odors were, the original reason why these odors were actually developed and marketed. So there was a scientist, Jeff Aldrich at a USDA lab. He was the person who originally identified these chemicals. And he worked with a company that for a while was actually selling this aggregation pheromone for that exact reason so that growers could actually put them into the field and use it to increase the attraction of the number of predators that were in their field. Um, so that is another potential dual benefit of releasing these odors. I'm gonna tell you about the effect it can have on the prey, but you're right, it can also have an effect on the predator. There is oh. one other question there, just since we've stopped. Would, <clears throat> would insect frass fertilizer help? I don't know what insect frass fertilizer is, but um, I'm guessing that <laughs> somebody's producing fertilizer that has insect frass in it. <laughs> well, that is a very interesting question because one of the scariest, for people who don't know, insect frass, frass is just another name for, for poop. Um, one of the, you can imagine, one of the scariest things around is poop of one of your conspecifics who's been eaten. You know, you can imagine predator poop that has your like Colorado potato beetles, you know, body parts in it is very scary. That's a very good cue that uh, something is eating you. And so I ha we haven't worked with that in this system, but it's definitely true in other systems. People are trying to use uh, frass as a, a those sort of poop odors as a way to alert organisms that there's danger in the environment. We should, we should work on that. We just haven't done that yet. And you know, this is the first seminar I've ever been in where we got to say the words poop odors. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think that might be the first time I've also ever said poop odor, but that's, we don't want to go down that route too much. Well, anyhow, we do. Okay, <laughs> keep asking the questions. It makes it much more fun. Okay, so we've identified these odors. <laughs> And we just wanted to characterize a little bit more of their biology. And this was a collaboration between uh, Nick Aflito, who's a graduate student in my lab, Abby Dittmar, who was an undergraduate, and Todd Eugine, who's a research associate. And they found, they wanted to just know more about who's releasing these odors and when. And so they, they looked at VOC releases in mature or old and young stink bugs. And they looked during the night and during the day. And actually what they found is that many more releases are made at night. The gray panel on the left is showing what they released at night. And you can just see that there's more releases overall at night compared to the white panel on the right, which is the day. And confirming what I showed you before, the tall green bar which is the old beetle is called, is releasing a lot more of the odor than the than the young beetles. So older beetles release volatiles more at night. It didn't seem to really matter whether there were females present or not. The females themselves, so you can see this is the number of releases again, the number of times the odor gets released at night versus the day. But here I'm showing you if you have two females, again the females aren't releasing that much two males, which is the purple bar, release a lot. If you have a male and a female, the blue bar, they release about the same amount total, maybe a little bit less. So it doesn't, we thought maybe you'd have to have, since it's an aggregation pheromone, maybe you would have to have females present in order for the males to release the odor, but that's not the case. They release if it's just males alone. Okay, so what did we learn here? We learned that this male spine soldier bug, uh, dorsal abdominal gland, elicited the response in the Colorado potato beetle. The gland mostly has these five major compounds, and they're released when the stink bug releases maturity and for you know seven to 14 days as an adult. And they release the, the males release the pheromone most in the evening and early morning. Okay, so based on this biology we start doing some of our field testing. 
And so we wanted to know what are, what if we release predator odors, pre put predators in the field and look at the effect of their odors, how does that affect the damage that the plants are getting, the presence of beetles, how many eggs they lay, that kind of thing. And so we did this over a couple of years. Um, we did this in 2016 and 2017. We did it on Yukon Gold because everybody loves Yukon Gold potatoes. And our treatments are, again, those bags that have a combination of male and female predators. Those are, and the controls are just an empty bag. And then we took our measurements on the plants around the focal, around the focal plant with the treatment. And we found really variable results. So this is showing you the control in gray compared to the treatment in blue. The top panel is in 2016, the bottom panel is 2017. And this is showing you the new, sort of the amount of new damage. So how much damage happened in that week? We measured this uh, every few weeks over the growing, over the potato growing season. And what you can see, if you look at the top bars, the very first week, I wish my mouse was working better so I could actually point to this, but you can see here at the beginning in this first week, we see a really strong reduction in damage um, in plants that are next to uh, the stink bugs. But it was really variable. If you look at the next week, we don't see any effect. And then in week five, it looks like there is effect again. And it kind of bounces up and down. So that overall, we did see a reduction, about 20% reduction in the presence of predators, but it's weak. And in 2017, we sometimes we saw a slight effect, but it's not significant. Um, I saw, I can see some of the questions that are coming in the chat, but they're coming fast and furious, which is fantastic. Sure. Um, one of the questions I saw was, somebody asked how far apart the plots were. And in this case, the plots were really close together. We each plot is basically five plants. The center plant has the release or not, if it's the control. And then we are looking at two plants away. And then we have a blank, so a sort of an empty plant that isn't part of the treatment. And then we have the next one. So this, this, this effect is all happening at a very small, a pretty small spatial scale. We had a lot of these bags out in the field. Some of the other questions are just on the difference between predatory stink bugs and plant feeding stink bugs, oh. which are pests. And Hillary yes. Peterson, who's with Maine IPM, is doing a nice job of answering questions for us and putting in resources. So thank you, Hillary. And we'll yes, collect those you. Up from the chat and uh, make sure that we get those posted as well. So thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. Great. Okay, good. Oh, and she did her PhD on brown marmaded stink bug. So she knows. Oh, okay, fantastic. Okay, so you're the expert. That's that's wonderful. Okay. The brown marmaded stink bug is a plant feeding one, which we don't like. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine yeah. soldier bug we do like. Yes. So so what did we learn from when we released the, li the live predators? We do see some effects of the live predators on beetle feeding, but it's really variable. And we don't know all of the causes of this variation. We think some of it is literally just the weather. One year it was much colder and wetter and we think the predators were simply less active. But um, this got us interested in the idea, again, that we might be able to apply this in the field, but just using the live predator might not give us the, a strong enough effect. And so now we want what we what we what we did next was to expand our field testing to use the synthetic pheromone. So instead of trying to scare the beetles, scare our prey using live predators, we wanted to know if we could actually put the, the aggregation pheromone into the field and whether that would have more consistent and stronger. So we developed a release device that we could use in the field. And we also wanted to try this out on an additional potato variety, just to see if it worked across different, different plants. So our release device in this case, the, the, the graduated cylinder is just showing you um, the mixture of the pheromone that we released. The really nice thing is that the pheromone components are, are, are available. You can actually buy them. So we could just buy them. We could mix them up in the right ratio. You can see in the bottom left here, it are, are, are our Eppendorf tubes, brown Eppendorf tubes, where we've mixed it up. 
and um, we can um, take those and put them into the field, or we can hang, we can actually hang septa from plants in the field. And that's really nice because um, these release devices, they very slowly release the odor so that you get a kind of continuous release that lasts for a couple of weeks. So there you can see it sort of just kind of like hanging off of the plant, off of the little potato plant in the field. Okay, so we tried this out on small plots with Yukon gold uh, potato plants and Superior. We used those UV protected release devices, the colored Eppendorf tubes. We measured beetle damage and behavior across different life stages. And we also measured some responses in the plant. We measured when the plant started to flower and we, remember, and we measured a yield. Okay, so here you can see I, we actually found very similar results with the Yukon Gold and the Superior, so we just combined them. I'm not going to show them to you separately. But what I am going to show you is that the treatment reduced the presence of all the life stages of the Colorado potato beetle. So you can see the eggs, you can see the, you can see the adults, you can see the eggs, you can see the larvae, and those um, were reduced in the treatment compared to the control. And notably, the number of larvae is decreased by about 30%, and the amount of plant damage is um, released about, re reduced about 45%, 46%. Do the bad stink bugs, you mean like the herbivore stink bugs? The brown, what, yeah. I'm not sure. I think that's what she bad. means. Yeah, the, um, in potato, we don't have real um, herbivorous, the herbivorous stink bugs that are, that are really pests. There's definitely other crops where there are, I'm not sure, I think I might've, that, that question might've actually left before I fully processed what it was. No, and I think and one thing to just say is that they actually have different kinds of mouth parts. So plant feeding stink bugs can't actually predate. They don't have the right, they don't have strong enough mouth parts. And if you look at stink bugs, you can, when you know something about stink bugs, you can find that. So we're, yeah, we're kind of gotten off onto other kinds of stink bugs. But in this case, because this predator is a stink bug, um, so it gets a little confusing and it does in the garden as well. So thank you yeah. for talking about those as well. Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody who's helping field questions. It's great having all these questions coming by. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So what we found was that um, when we look at the effect on, when we follow, when we continue that, so we found the effect on the beetles and the amount of damage. When we look at the effect on the plant, we, I'm not showing you this, but it did actually cause the beetles to flower earlier and it caused a marginally significant effect on yield. So about a 10% increase in yield for plots that had been exposed to the pheromone. This wasn't significant, so it's something that we're continuing to follow up on so we can repeat it and see, because a 10% effect, if it was significant, could be, could be important for a grower. So what did we learn here? That we found much more consistency in field trials when we use the synthetic pheromone. And we hypothesized that that's just because with the synthetic pheromone, we can get it out there all the time. We don't have to worry about whether it's released during the day or whether it's released during the night or whether the, the age of the male, all of that biology that's so important for when the, the actual stink bug predator is releasing the pheromone. When we're using the artificial pheromone, we just can know that it's out there and release it in a consistent high dose. So it spurred on by these results, we've been working to try this out, try out the stink bug pheromone on, on actual farms. And so we got a little bit delayed by COVID, but um, we have worked with NOFA to get the materials approved for use in organic farms. And last year was the first year where we actually tried using the synthetic blend on in actual grower fields. And so that's what we're currently working on right now, working with growers, trying to test whether this pheromone works in additional crops. So we're also trying in particular on eggplant 
because that's a another crop where, where uh, Colorado potato beetle can be a pest, some varieties of eggplant. We're also trying it out in high tunnels. Uh, eggplant and potato are both grown in high tunnels and in open fields, and we don't know if this process will work the same. Um, and we're also looking to look to look at effects on other organisms as one of the question, one of the questions was about, well, how will this affect predators? We'd also like to know how does it affect both the stink bug predator as well as potentially other predators that are in the field? Will there in crops that care about pollinators, will there be effects on pollinators? Um, could there potentially be effects on disease causing microbes? Those are just future areas that we're continuing in. And so with that, I will stop and thank you for your attention and um, keep asked, hopefully keep answering any of these wonderful questions that you're having. So we have one here about how many years of data do you have using the synthetic pheromone? We have two years of data using the synthetic pheromone in our research plots. And we're just starting now to work on grower farms. And we're hoping to get um, a couple, at least two or three years of data um, with the current grant that we have working on actual on working on actual farms. So it's a good point to make about how long it takes to get something like this available to be used. There's also a question on do Japanese beetles have natural predators? I yes, I you know Jap somebody else helped me out here because I actually don't know a huge amount about what feeds on Japanese beetles. Is anybody else on the audience who's been no? I don't know. I just think if there's something to eat, something will figure out how to eat it. But sometimes things have toxins as well. Um, Actually, there's some birds around my house that eat Japanese beetles, um, or at least I find little bits of the beetles all over my porch. <laughs> I don't remember which type of bird it is, but. Oh, and yet nematodes, that... nematodes take out the grubs, Carol says. Yep, that's right. We have yes. a talk on nematodes tomorrow, I believe. Yes, um, good point. There's also one from Hillary. Oops. If, if a crop is susceptible to herbivorous stink bugs, I would be curious to know if the synthetic pheromone would attract the other stink bugs. There are studies showing that stink bugs listen in to the pheromones of other stink bug species, but not sure if herbivores slash predators do. That's a great question. I, I love that question. It really gets at how the community of herbivores and predators are kind of eavesdropping on all sorts of different kinds of information. And it's just the whole chemical communication is fascinating. And one of the reasons why I think it's particularly interesting <clears throat> in the stink bugs is because, you know, when we think about, say, pheromones for some of the moths, some, you know, some of you might work in codling moth or some of the species where we have like very specific pheromones that they're using, which are very particular chemicals that only a small set of organisms probably sort of sense as part of their biology. This, the odors that the stink bugs are releasing are very different. They are very common odors that are released by a lot of different organisms. So this, you know, the stink, I showed you the chemicals that are in the stink bug of this particular species of stink bug. And they are actually shared by plants. So a lot of the odors that the stink bugs are releasing are also released by the host plants and are used by a lot of herbivores to find their host plants and maybe also to detect their predators. So the point being that I think that's just a very good question that there will undoubtedly be members, lots of members of the community who are tuned into these chemicals, maybe for different reasons, for different aspects of their biology. But then if we go, if we start to release them with one particular outcome in mind, all sorts of other things could also happen. And I think there's some research that shows that things change over time, that insects start picking up on different plant chemicals and using them as attractants where they once were repellents. So it, yeah, it's a very dynamic system. Oh, so, and I'm now amazed that any, that any Japanese beetles survive because Frogs and toads eat them. Chickens love them if you knock them down for them. Skunks, raccoons, birds eat the grubs but cause problematic damage. Scolid wasps parasitize Japanese beetle larvae as well. And Tiffia is a wasp that loves peonies and parasitizes Japanese beetle. We have a very, very smart audience. 
Plus some of the, and then Henry also says, plus some of those chemicals are released by plants attacked by herbivores to attract parasitoids. So nature is complex for sure. Yes, absolutely. The other thing that I think our discussion has brought up is it's really important to identify what you find in the garden. Because if you just see something and it looks like a stink bug, then stink bugs look a lot alike. Sometimes you might say, okay, that's a pest and I need to get rid of it and actually be re removing a parasite, a, a predator that you want to keep. So um, it is, it is the, the, the mouth parts are one of the ways you can tell, which means you have to handle the stink bug. Um, but so if you can start learning the differences and thank you, Hillary, for putting in some of those websites that compare the different kinds. So you get some better ideas of how to identify what you've got. Um, that's really one of the points that's important. Um, I, we can add, I could add some pictures maybe for when we give them, since there have been so many questions about this, maybe when we send out the materials, perfect. maybe add a picture of the, the predatory stink bug, because they also are a little bit smaller than the brown marmorated, and they don't have the same color patterns on their back. So those two mm -hmm. species in particular, you can also look at and tell the difference. So maybe I can add, I'll, I'll add a slide with a picture of that if I can, to the end of my talk so people can see that. Great, thank you. And Deb says, all confirmations that we have biocontrol partners in our garden. She's a good marketing person. <laughs> so are there any more questions for Jennifer? We have, we have you know, 10 minutes now and we're, we can, you can ask questions. Um, <laughs> someone says, that's because we're all emotionally scarred for life because of the brown marmorated stink bug. <laughs> My cats were chasing one last night. So yeah, there's a few around here. <laughs> um, so yeah, any other questions? Well, thank you all for asking so many questions because that's we, what makes giving these talks so much fun. So thank you. We do, and we had a really nice comment on such creative, innovative research. Really appreciate hearing about it. So thank you to the audience. Thank you. As well. All right.